Hello everybody, I'm your host Hal Curtis and I'd like to welcome you to The Space Industry by SatSearch, where we share stories about the companies taking us into orbit. In this podcast, we delve into the opinions and expertise of the people behind the commercial space organisations of today who could become the household names of tomorrow. Before we get started with the episode, remember you can find out more information about the suppliers, products and innovations that are mentioned in this discussion on the global marketplace for space at satsearch.com. Hi everybody and welcome to today's episode of the Space Industry Podcast by Satsearch. I'm joined today by a uh, returning guest on the podcast, Laura Crabtree from Epsilon3. Now Epsilon3 is a US-based software company focusing on various aspects of space missions and engineering and operations in other industries as well, which Laura will explain much more about in this in this podcast. So Laura, thank you very much uh, for being here today. I'd like to welcome you to the podcast. Great, great to have you here and to speak, give, give us some insights for our listeners. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me back. Good to talk to you again. Fantastic. So as I mentioned, Laura, you have been on the podcast before, but we at the time that we've spoken previously, we haven't really spent time discussing your own personal career and the journey that your professional journey that's led you to to where you are today in Epsilon 3. So I was wondering if you could give listeners a bit of an overview about your work and your background in the space industry and indeed beyond. Sure, of course. So I guess I usually like to start out by talking about why I got into the space industry and when it happened when I was around eight or nine years old, um, which is the age of my oldest child right now, funny enough. And I became obsessed with the shuttle launches. And I watched every shuttle launch I could, uh, pending my parents letting me stay up late or wake up early. Uh, I obviously didn't miss school for any of them, but when I could watch or when I could watch uh, replays on the news, I was uh, very excited to dive into that. And following that, I went to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama when I was in high school, which I'm not sure if what most people go when they're a lot younger. I went later in life because I, I wanted to immerse myself in what it meant to be working in the space industry. And I took that time to really learn about space and learn about what it took to work in the industry and took my career into the space industry by going to university for Aero Astro. At the time, there was uh, not really very many degrees in space. So I went to the closest thing I could find, which was astronautics at the time at USC. And I did my undergrad there and started working shortly after graduation, I think maybe six weeks in um, the space industry at Northrop Grumman. I spent about five and a half years at Northrop Grumman working in space operations and systems engineering. Um, Most of that time was actually spent in England. I worked in Northern England in a town called Harrogate and lived there, worked there, working, rotating operations, 12-hour shifts. And then upon leaving England, I was looking at moving back to California, which is where I am now. And there was this company that had been recruiting me. I had a couple of friends that went over there called SpaceX. And I had always wanted to work in human spaceflight. Going back to where I was when I was eight and nine, there weren't a lot of options when I graduated in human spaceflight other than going to NASA, which I thought maybe later in my career I would do. But when SpaceX offered the position for mission operations engineer, I just thought that would be the best fit for all the things I would want to do. And I started there with almost a clean slate of what our operations would look like. The group that I was in was approximately 10 people. I'm not going to be uh, doing this justice, but it was 10 people working in operations, training, recovery, ground systems development, ground station development. So ground systems being all of our telemetry and data processing, all of our GUI training being what do all the operators do? What does the concept of operations look like? What do our operational procedures look like? And how do our operators make decisions? And so I took that into the 11 years that I spent there. And over that time, 
internal tools, developed the training regimen, worked with closely with our NASA partners on the integrated operations that we were going to be working and ISS integration. How was Dragon going to work with the International Space Station once we got there? And really enjoyed my time dug in a lot and then transitioned over to commercial crew and realized my dream of sending people to space in 2020. And after that, decided that it was time to move on and find the next challenge of what I could do in this industry. And and that's what led me to Epsilon 3. Fantastic. And if I may ask, what was it that kicked off the the idea for Epsilon 3? Why did you why did you make that next leap? Yes. When I was at SpaceX, there was no startup culture. There, there were almost no space startups. There were a few small space companies. But when I was at SpaceX, we had developed a lot of internal tools to help our operations move smoother, faster, more efficient with less people. And we were able to do that. We were able to realize what we wanted to do, which was take that big control room of 24 people and really get down to what are the most important things people need to do and how do you get the best information in front of people to operate with the smallest team at a smaller company. And looking at the landscape of space startups once I left, there were a ton of them that didn't exist when I started at SpaceX. And a lot of them I thought might need tools like some of the things that I knew we needed to operate our vehicles. And I started writing down my ideas and all the while actually looking at what is my next challenge, what other companies, what other startups are out there that I could work at. And most of the startups that I talked to were either developing internal tools or thinking about developing internal tools. And my thought around that was if this existed on a commercial setting, would people buy it and would it help them move faster? And to take some of your software engineers, which are some of the highest paid engineers in the space industry, and dedicate their time to building internal tools when they could build flight software, when they could be building the command and telemetry system that actually makes the missions work, I thought that was probably not the right way to go about that. And I thought if I could build a commercial off the shelf software, which I didn't at the time know what SaaS was. So software as a service, I did not know that term existed. If I could build a software that would actually help them that they could just buy, that would actually free up those people to actually build towards the mission rather than building something that other people could use. And so that's why I started Epsilon 3. Fantastic. Oh, it makes sense. So there's a, a combination there of, yeah, a growing industry with companies that, like you, as you say, didn't really exist at the, at the scale that you were able to work with when SpaceX was in its early years. A combination of that and recognizing that you have the knowledge and expertise to help them with really mission critical aspects makes sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think if I had started Epsilon 3 five years earlier, we wouldn't have the user base that we have today. We wouldn't have made it. It wouldn't have been such a a big thing. But because the industry has evolved and grown and is going to continue to grow, this is something that is needed in the industry. And I want to be able to provide that service to these companies, whether they're 20-person companies, 200 or 5,000-person companies, to help them really focus on their missions rather than building internal tools that might slow them down. Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely makes sense. And in this work then today, you obviously, are, it, it's, it comes under the banner of digital transformation, which is a it's a key part of what you do, and it's evident in all sorts of industries and sectors across the world, as, as we keep saying, how software is eating the world. I wonder if you could share with us, or the, share with the listeners, some of the sort of trends in digital transformation that you're seeing or you're observing in the space industry specifically over the last few years. As you said, things are changing, companies are growing and scaling up. And yeah, are you seeing changes in how this digital aspect of the processes is, is working and is being relied upon? 
Yeah, of course. I think digital transformation is, is another term that I didn't know existed until I started Epsilon 3, along with so many other colloquialisms that we have in this industry and others. But I think the biggest thing that I see is everything was digital when computers came about. But what happened was we took our digital copies of things and we printed them out or we emailed them to one another for review or we put them on a desktop somewhere to save. And the thing that I'm seeing in digital transformation is we want tools that are interconnected with one another. We want tools that give you real-time updates. I could say that a Microsoft Word document, no offense to Microsoft Word, I, I love it. It's a very powerful tool, but there are certain things that it is absolutely necessary for, and there are certain things that other tools might be better served for. And so if you look at how companies are thinking about their digital footprint, they want someone at home because since COVID, we uh, we have a more spread out workforce. We have people that work from home two days a week. We have people that work from home all the time. We have people at different companies who are working in Seattle and Los Angeles. We have people that are working cross country or in, in different countries. And if something requires you to go to the person's desk, send them a Slack message or a Mattermost message or a Teams message, you're already broken because you're requiring additional work to find valuable information. And so what companies want is a platform that, or multiple platforms that are connected to one another that give you the information you need when you need it. So right away, you don't have to wait because the program is slow. You don't have to search too hard because you know what you need is utterly apparent in front of your face. You don't have to ask anybody for information. So that's the biggest thing that I'm seeing in digital transformation is just that interconnectedness and data on demand more than I have to go ask somebody for something. Yeah, definitely. And then you get into all sorts of additional kind of application areas where you've got time zone arbitrage and geographic arbitrage and mission teams who can collaborate. Obviously, collaborative research projects, big thing in the Europe. Teams can effectively collaborate in real time, working remotely. So um, it makes sense. One thing um, I was interested in is, obviously, with space missions, a lot of the software and the hardware has been developed with a, a a high level of confidentiality in mind in the past, especially in defense-related applications and legacy space applications. How does this translate into the use of more flexible software tools, that cloud-based versus deploying software on-premises, for example? Is this a conversation that, that comes up a lot? Is this an important part of this? Yes, yeah, security is a conversation that comes up with every single one of our customers. And security is something that we've had an eye on since the very beginning. We started our platform on the GovCloud on AWS because we knew the people who we wanted to serve. We knew that our customers had higher level of security requirements, but we also built our software to be able to be deployed on-premise coming from a company like Northrop Grumman. I knew that Northrop Grumman was not going to be quick to adopt cloud-hosted platforms, especially like in, in the event of a more secure environment. If you're working on secure programs, you cannot use the cloud. So both of those are available, but I am seeing that there are more secure cloud environments that people are becoming more and more comfortable with. As in, we're working with a couple of groups within the government, and they are all happy to work on the cloud. We are also working with a number of government contractors, some of which who want to work on the cloud and are comfortable with it, and some of whom are not. And so we can support both, but I'm seeing more of a shift just throughout the space software environment, if you will, to cloud-based solutions, because it is a lot less overhead for the company to manage. And it, it really makes things a lot easier for us, because as we deploy 
as, as us being any of the, the providers. As we deploy software, it is deployed to everyone right away on the cloud. But when you have an on-premise deployment, you might be behind. So when a company asks for an upgrade to something or a new feature, and we as the provider roll it out on the cloud, we tell all of our users, hey, this is available. But for our on-premise users, they want to use those new features that they have asked for, but they're unable to do so until their IT department has rolled out the next version. And I, we don't have control over that. And so that's another thing that I think is pushing more people towards the cloud is because there is a lot faster development in software these days than there was previously. And because of that, people are wanting new features. They're wanting more functionality as quick as they can get it, but they're not going to get it as quickly when they deploy on-premise. Yeah, absolutely. They don't want to consider their own IT department as an extension of your customer service, right? It's, it's, that's interesting. This uh, it mirrors the or is an extension of the hardware conversation that we handle a lot with manufacturers all over the world of build versus buy, right? And this is a similar sort of a similar sort of thing. Although you're buying, whether you're deploying on premise or, or in the cloud, but yeah, deciding whether to take full control of that production in house and manage everything in house versus buy in the capabilities that you require is a key trade off. Yeah, and I think the same argument goes for build versus buy and hardware. You know, you want to build the thing that makes your mission special, that makes you, your company, but you don't want to build everything because there are so many commercial off the shelf solutions for your build, whatever it might be. And I would say it will help you move faster with a smaller team. So I've met a lot of companies who are more integrators and less builders. So they're doing a lot more trade studies on what's the best solution for me, what's the best hardware for my vehicle, whatever it might be. It's the same here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is yeah, our bread and butter at a, on the SaaS platform, of course, helping these sorts of engineers with these with these challenges and i think um, a lot of this ties into the theme that you mentioned that this industry as a the space industry as a whole is professionalizing in a lot of areas and companies are scaling production whether that means increasing throughput and volume or simply trying to become faster or more versatile as well if you're if your key customers are going to be uh, companies that have change in mission requirements on a rapid basis then it's the versatility that's more important to you rather than the speed of, uh, of iterating the core technology. But because of this, we see a lot of focus on, we see an increase in focus on, I think, assembly integration and testing AIT tools and processes. What sort of challenges, uh, this is an area obviously that Epsilon 3 provides solutions in as well on the software side. So I wondered if you could share some of the challenges that you're seeing in this area that maybe the space industry is yet to solve or is solving at the moment. Is grappling with. Yeah, I see a lot of a lot more focus on AI and T. Previously, there was a lot more focus on design and preliminary design reviews to get everything right at the beginning. But now I'm seeing a big shift towards test to failure, understand the failure, redesign quickly, test to failure until you get a solution that works. And this goes back to the speed at which SpaceX kind of is pushing the, the whole industry. So if you look at how fast SpaceX is iterating on their designs, early designs, they don't do it necessarily on their designs. They do still change the vehicles every time they relaunch just a little bit. So they'll iterate as much as needed. But when you're looking at something like Starship or early Falcon 9 or early Grasshopper, there was iteration on the order of weeks, months, rather than iteration on the order of years, which is what you would see in more traditional companies. And because companies are smaller and yet need to deliver on that same pace, they are actually doing a lot more testing and because of that, they need to have 
traceability of testing. They need to know what they're testing against, who did, who performed the testing. And then they need to use that information to iterate on designs. And the reason why we've built out more functionality in assembly integration and test is because we're seeing that push towards really getting down to what is the necessary design? What are the potential failure modes? How can we test to them, pass them to get the best design so that when we get to the mission, we have the highest probability of success and without five years of development time. And so that's why we've been putting a lot of effort towards that portion of our platform. Interesting. What are some of the core AI and T features of the platform that you could explain? Yeah, so we are integrating with a lot of other tools that previously when we had talked, I I don't believe we had. So we're integrating with requirements tools now. We're integrating with PLM tools so that we can help teams understand the version history of their designs, build against parts and their inventory, and then have traceability of when parts were used in a build, how many times they've been used, what types of tests were run against parts or assemblies. And then once those assemblies are put onto a vehicle, now you still have full traceability of everything that's been done to that entire vehicle when in flight so that it's easy to when in flight, go back to testing data to see, oh, this part was replaced potentially, or this part came from this lot. And let me look at where everything else went from that lot because I had a failure in that lot. So let me remove everything from that lot from any vehicle that it went into. And it's that kind of traceability that I think people really are enjoying within Epsilon 3. So it's been where we've been putting a lot of effort. Our customers really liked what we had done with procedures and the traceability that we gave them on who was able to sign off on something, what kind of data did they need to have to make the decision to sign off. But earlier, let's say a year and a half ago, they were lacking some of the traceability of what they were testing against. And so that's why we started integrating with other platforms to give that traceability. Fantastic. That makes sense. Thank you, Laura, for explaining explaining those areas there. Now, obviously, you mentioned SpaceX and the Starship example, probably the most (laughs) well-known example of a technology development program in the industry. They've, I say they, as opposed to Elon Musk, but um, SpaceX as a company has made the kind of iterative testing to failure a key part of the narrative, if not the mystique of the company. Partially because Starship is so visible, you can't hide these tests, but they've really, exactly, but they've really embraced this as the story of the business and the development of this technology in a big way. And I think that's worked very successfully for them. I wondered what your thoughts were, if you have any, on taking this approach, on other companies taking this approach, whether it's a good idea or not, obviously for technology programs that are not completely confidential. Should should your failure be public is what I guess I'm asking? I think we've seen a lot of examples where being open and honest about failures in public is a good thing. You have seen most recently... SpaceX had a failure and within hours, they came out, started talking about the failure that they had. They told the public what happened to the extent that they knew. And that's a comes in a long string of companies being open and honest about this industry. This industry is, is hard. You can't sugarcoat that in any way. A couple other examples, Astrobotic was very open and honest about their mission failure. And I commend them for how open they were about what they were doing. And I think that was, yeah, it was amazing. And the other one was Starfish. Starfish was very open and honest all over social media, talking about what their team was doing, how hard their team was working to come back from the failure. They were spinning and they needed to get that under control. And I think seeing the perseverance of teams 
is human. And it's really amazing to see. And people really want to support teams that work really hard for what they believe in. And being really open and honest about it not only shows the public that this industry is hard and 100 launches in a row with no failure, 100 plus, I don't know the exact number, is not normal, right? We want it to be normal and and it is more normal than it was, but there are still huge risks of failure. So I think being able to test a failure before the mission, so let's say you have a component and that component must work in the mission. You want to fully test that component, pending you have enough money to buy another one when you break it. You want to test that component to failure or almost to failure to know and characterize how this component is going to act in space. And I wouldn't say necessarily spend all your money and launch not knowing and using that as a test. But if you have enough money to use a launch and you're doing something small, let's say you're going on a rideshare mission on a transporter and it's a very small vehicle and your vehicle is very large and you want to test three of the 20 components that you have. Make a small vehicle, test those components, see what happens, do it again with the next components, and you can use that as your iterative process. So I'm not advocating for huge tests that put the company out of business. Looking at what you can do to reduce risk when you get to the real thing. That's what I think has really driven the industry into, I want to see a successful mission at the end of this. Here are the 10 things I can do to reduce risk, to give me the highest probability of success at that mission. And that's what we're seeing more of now. And I think being open and honest about this, I give this a 50% chance of success because this is a test mission. And I love that approach because I think it gets the public behind. If it works, how amazing. If it doesn't, it's all a learning experience to get to the real thing. So I really love that approach. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I think it's um, it's the the right way to to be operating in the industry. And if multiple companies are operating like that, then it comes down to how good you are at learning from those failures and communicating the what you've learned from those failures, both internally and externally. And to bring it back, I guess that's where software tools such as Epson Three give you a really good advantage. Saving the data, obviously the execution data, uh, your telemetry and command data from the vehicle to be able to fully characterize what was going on in the vehicle at the time of failure, that is the most important piece. And then looking up to the data that was leading up to the failure, that's also very important. And having that all in one platform, that's pretty much why we exist. We want to give you all of that information with timestamps of what happened, who was there, why it happened, and then be able to characterize your anomaly response post anomaly to be able to then learn from it and redesign or redesign either your vehicle or redesign your operation so that doesn't happen again. Fantastic. Great. I have one last question, Laura. Now this is um, a variation on the the final question I asked you in our previous uh, uh, podcast episodes, so it'll be interesting to to see the the answers there. But I wondered what you were most excited about in the space industry over the next few years. Oh man, I, I will have to see if my answer changes. But I am really excited about all of the data that we are getting from Earth observation. What we can learn about the human condition. What we can learn about our world to be able to make our world safer, to be able to make our world more productive or be able to grow crops better. A a lot of information is coming from space. And then obviously the second thing, which goes back to my time being an eight and nine-year-old, which is I want to see more people going to space and being able to experience it. And I have a couple of friends going up hopefully at the end of July, early August on the Polaris Dawn mission. And I'm excited to see them fly. And so I'm excited also to see all of these private space station companies either working together in the form of uh, Gravitics and Axiom now supporting one another and building private space stations so that people can experience space for themselves. 
the, the, the general person, not just a select few. And I think that will be a hugely pivotal moment in our history as humans. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. That's a great place to wrap up. Thank you very much for sharing um, all these insights and the, the the background as well to your your company and your own career and yeah, your thoughts on the industry, some trends that we're seeing in terms of the digital transformation aspect of things, but also the ways that companies are scaling and professionalizing, becoming more efficient, more versatile. It was really useful, I think. And then obviously to get your thoughts too on how companies should communicate and use data on successes and failures, and more, more critically on failures, internally and externally, I think is um, really useful for people. So yeah, thank you very much, Laura. It's great to have you with us here today. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Thank you. And to all our listeners out there, thank you too for uh, spending time with us today on the Space Industry Podcast. We'll share more information about Epsilon 3 in the show notes, and you can find out plenty on the company's website and on the SatSearch platform. You can dig into all the different aspects of the software and the different capabilities it can provide mission teams and please check tune in with us soon for the next episode of the space industry podcast where we will be sharing more stories about those companies taking us all into orbit thank you thank you for listening to this episode of the space industry by satsearch i hope you enjoyed today's story about one of the companies taking us into orbit we'll be back soon with more in-depth behind the scenes insights from private space businesses In the meantime, you can go to satsearch.com for more information on the space industry today or find us on social media if you have any questions or comments. To stay up to date, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can also get each podcast on demand on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store or whichever podcast service you typically use. 